Partner Coffee to Connect v mesecu novembru je KPMG v Sloveniji. Pozdravljeni na Coffee to Connect v mesecu novembru. Good morning to everybody and welcome to today's Coffee to Connect November edition with partner KPMG. Our guest speaker is an American with Slovene roots. He was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and lives in Germany for 20 plus years. A warm welcome to Steve Stadešinic. Hello, Steve. Uh, hello, živjo vide and uh, živjo dragi amšam skomdosti. Uh, oh, lepo, lepo. In Slovene. Great, great. Great. So and we're going to do the rest of this in uh, English. So, uh, that would be too hard uh, for me to do it in Slovenian. It would be very hard on your audience and we don't want that. Absolutely. Maybe next time we'll do it partly in English, partly in, in German language. In but, the election in four years, yes. <laughs> okay. So Steve's profession is accounting, finance and offering consultancy to European companies that are expanding to US market. And this morning we'll talk about how the government decision in the US can have an impact to your business and what changes can we expect now we already know with the new administration or we don't know already. But first, Steve, let's take a look at your home state, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was again the battleground states, as you say. Mm -hmm. And Pennsylvania was a long time blue state, so the Democratic state, but turned to Trump in 2016. This year, they again choose the Democratic candidate. So why did this happen in 2016 or better? Why did it turn again to Democratic candidate in this uh, election in 2020? Yes, uh, Pennsylvania was uh, very close. As we predicted on our election night uh, event, it was too close to call and it would take numerous days before a winner uh, was clear or would be declared. And the reason for that, of course, is, is that there were over 4 million uh, absentee ballots, mail-in ballots, and none of them could be opened or counted until the day of the election after all of the polls were closed. So that was a very long and drawn out process. What turned out, uh, it seems in the initial analysis is, is that both candidates, Biden and Trump, increased the number of votes that they would have gotten for their respective parties four years ago. And the and Trump, for instance, won more votes with um, minority voters and in other demographics that he normally, a Republican candidate, normally does not do as well with. And the one demographic where he lost votes were college-educated suburban voters. That is outside of the two urban areas, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And that was primarily the reason that he lost. And that data matches with a lot of anecdotal evidence that I and many other people have heard. The people in that demographics who include really the entrepreneurial class and the professional class, they, many of them state, they normally don't necessarily vote for a Democratic Party candidate, but they were dissatisfied with just the behavior of Trump. They wanted to vote for somebody who was more presidential. So if he would have been probably a less, somewhat less controversial, less combative, he would have done better and he may have 
been able to secure the victory again, but he didn't. Uh, Steve, we are a business community, um, and so we need to know our companies, our members need to know, can can the new administration impact my business? So, so but uh, before we know that, we need to know how the government in the US is structured. Can you, in short, explain so how the government is structured in the US and I see that there are already slides and you can uh, in shortly present uh, how the government is structured. Yes, this is very good to keep in mind. So we'll do a quick lesson in American civics, the structure of the government. As you see on this first slide, there are three branches of the US federal government and the state governments of the 50 states are also divined, uh, designed in a similar manner. On the left, you see the one branch, the legislative, they're responsible for making laws. And you see there are two parts of it, two chambers. One of the first part is the Senate, and it has 100 members, two from each state, so each state is equally represented. The other house, the other chamber is the House of Representatives, 435 members, and they are elected from states according to the size of the population. So California has the most, 55 I think it is, Pennsylvania has 18 for instance, and the states with a small population only have one. Then the second uh, branch of the US government is the executive branch and that's represented by its head, the president of the United States and under the president or working for the president in the executive branch are the cabinet that is what in Europe are called the ministries, the ministers and other agencies are all the regulatory agencies, which of course are very important, have a lot of impact on businesses operating in the US. Those were created by the executive branch and they are under the executive branch. And then we have the judicial branch, which are federal courts, and it's topped by the highest court, the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, of course, was in the news over the past couple uh, weeks and months because a new justice was appointed, Amy Coney Barrett, to replace uh, Ruth Ginsburg, who is deceased. So you, you have to keep this in mind when we're talking about the rest. So next slide, please. The US government is designed to be divided. It's designed to have each branch should have checks and balances, measures and countermeasures against the other branch branches so that they do not become too powerful. And obviously we could spend the whole 45 minutes just on this, but a few examples are Congress, that is the House of Representatives and Senate together have to pass a law the president of the United States can veto, that is refuse the law, so then it doesn't go into effect, but the Congress can override the president's veto, but only with a two thirds majority, which is very, very difficult to achieve. Then we look at the president's uh, powers. Uh, the uh, president has a power, has the power to, to appoint judges to the Supreme Court. And of course the president appoints uh, ministers, department heads in his own administration, but they have to be approved by Congress, usually the Senate. And of course, the courts, especially the Supreme Court, can, de can declare a law that was passed by Congress and approved by the president, so it actually became a law, can declare it unconstitutional, so then that law cannot go into effect. So you see each branch has different ways to counteract the other and to stop that other branch from, in theory, becoming too powerful. Next slide, please. What is very important, the first thing to keep in mind about the structure of the US state and the US government is federalism. That is, there are some powers that are held by the federal government in Washington, D.C., and some, most, are held by the individual states. So next slide, please. So this, once again, we could spend uh, many sessions just talking about all of these. The states have 
more of the powers according to the U.S. Constitution than the federal government does. And we'll highlight just one or two of the most important ones. For instance, we see on the right side, state government powers. The third from the bottom is protect public health, safety, and morals. So this is very clear in the COVID situation that all countries are going through, the United States is going through. The authority to deal with COVID or any other public health issue is with the individual states and not with the federal government. That's very important. Establishing local governments, the second from the top, establishing and maintaining schools. Education in the United States is regulated by the individual states. And of course, some states have a better education system than others. Some states have better health care system and infrastructure than others. That's just a characteristic of federalism. And let's look very quickly on the left side, the powers of the uh, federal government, um, the the biggest ones, the most significant ones are the power to declare war, but that has to be approved by the Senate. The president cannot declare and start a war, so to speak, all by himself, at least not according to the Constitution. And of course, foreign policy is mainly situated with the federal government that's logical and not the states. So obviously, uh, foreign countries, foreign governments have to deal with the president a lot uh, because the leg the um, executive branch, the president has most of the powers with uh, foreign policy. And of course, immigration, very important to doing business in the U.S. for foreign companies, is also one of the powers of the federal government and not the states. Next slide, please. Uh, just two slides. We're looking at an individual state, and I'm going to choose uh, my home state of Pennsylvania that I know the most. All states are broken down into smaller political units, and the first uh, unit is a county. And you see here all of the 67 counties of Pennsylvania. Does Pennsylvania need 67 counties? Probably not, but they were all created in the 18th and the 19th century. None of them are going to vote themselves out of existence and join another county because then they would lose their little power center. They're not going to do that. Election regulations are established by the state and then partly in addition to that by the individual counties. So you see in the state of Pennsylvania, they run their election much differently than some other states do and each county can run it differently than another county. So last slide, please. So you see there, that is a breakdown of my county, native county of Allegheny, of which the uh, my hometown of Pittsburgh is the capital. And then you see the final ultimate breakdown of the political units in the U.S. Cities, towns, townships, boroughs, municipalities. These things are also very important for your local business. Uh, if uh, you're running a business in the U.S. that produces something, the infrastructure is very dependent, of course, on the municipality, on the smallest unit, uh, how you're going to have electricity, the traffic, how what you're allowed to do, what kind of real estate you're allowed to have, how you're supposed to dispose of industrial waste, things like that, all very important to companies which have to produce much of that is done at the county and the municipal level. These are all very important. Uh, last uh, thing that I'd like to say about American civics before we move on to our next topics is the elections that we just had, which we're in the middle of, we're not finished with them yet, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, is a very useful and instructive, instructive case study about how the U.S. state is organized, how it works, how it operates with all of its strengths and weaknesses, with the good and the bad, and we can use this knowledge to uh, help us work better and prepare to uh, operate better in the U.S. And we keep in mind there too, of course, federalism. This voting process, a little bit of it is regulated in the U.S. Constitution at the federal level, but almost every aspect of the election process is regulated by the state and then by the individual counties. So you have a layer of 
processes, a layer of regulations that we have to keep in mind and we have to follow. And then another thing that is very obvious uh, when we're dealing in the US, and this is with the public sector and also with the private sector, you ha we have always a mixed model of modern, efficient, automated processes, and then sort of old fashioned, outdated, partly manual processes. So you saw this very much in the election. We had millions of online ballots uh, to register for an online ballot, an absentee ballot like I did. That was partly an online process, partly a manual process. And there were four or five steps to it. And then the counting of the votes and the testing and the recounting and all of that, that was mostly manual and a little bit automated and it could certainly be more efficient. So very often when we operate in the US, we just have to be aware. A lot of things are not as automated and as efficient as they are, for instance, in the public sector in the European Union countries. So thank, thank you. Thank you, that was the last slide. Uh, before before we proceed with uh, uh, I proceed with another question. I would like to encourage all all that are participating this conversation with Steve. They can uh, pose uh, you you can pose your question in the section Q and A, and uh, Steve will try to answer on each and every question. This looks like a complicated thing. What you yeah. explained just for a couple of minutes. But in, in practice, it's not such a complicated. So if you look, Steve, from the business perspective, so would you advise to a company so that they focus first on municipality regulations, then on county, on state? Because, because federal decisions, they don't have uh, such an impact on directly on the business. Would you agree with that? Uh, uh, partly. Uh, I think we have to, uh, it depends on the industry, of course, because some industries, for instance, such as pharmaceuticals and uh, food processing are regulated at a federal level because the executive branch, the president, uh, over a hundred years ago put in a lot of agencies and a lot of regulations that are supposed to govern these things. And the states um, have some additional regulations on, on top of that, so you have to look at both, of course. And then there are some other industries, for instance, with uh, production. There, the federal government doesn't necessarily regulate anything. You have, uh, you have independent organizations such as the Underwriters Laboratory, UL is an example of that. You have to follow their regulations, and then you have to look at the state and the municipal level where you're actually producing the goods and services because they their regulations and their inspections will have much more of an impact on your business than anything that is coming from the federal government. And of course, Americans are used to this uh, and the Europeans see the president of the United States on the news all the time because it's very easy for everybody to focus in on this one figure, this one very important person. But that can lead us into air when we're doing business because a lot of times the president of the United States is saying something over which the executive branch or the federal government does not have any jurisdiction. So we don't want to worry about what necessarily what the president says. We want to find out who is our relevant regulator for our business, for our industry. What are they doing? What do they do? What regulations have they put out? What inspections have they conducted and they've put in a report? All of that's in the public realm. That's what we have to concentrate on, not what the president says necessarily. Okay. So you mentioned, Steve, the FDA, for example, which is uh, quite uh, uh, an important matter for food and, and pharma companies. And vaccines, for instance, right now. Yeah. The vaccines yeah. have to be approved by and the FDA. Now we are, we are in a period, we are waiting for the final result of the elections. It will be on, on December 14th. But right. in the meanwhile, is the the uh, are the state institutions uh, uh, working normally or some of the procedures can be prolonged 
What they can a company are, expect if they are yeah. waiting, for example, for FDA approval? What what can they expect? They can expect, uh, in my opinion, normal processing, normal procedures, because the majority of the workforce of all of the agencies, whether it is at a federal level or it is at a state level or a municipal level, those are professional career civil servants. So they are they have worked there for decades. They're going to continue working there regardless of who the leadership of their agency is. Naturally, uh, if you work at one of those agencies and you believe that there's going to be a new president or a new governor in a state, you realize some of your long term projects that you started this year and are going to run for two or three years, the future governor, the future president, or the future legislature may not uh, give you funds uh, to do the work or may not uh, give you other resources or may not support it. That affects your long-term strategic planning, but the actual work that's being done right now uh, I don't think the election process, even though it's a, protract, a protracted process, um, has a negative or really any other impact um, on their work. Uh, Steve, can you explain um, if if you can actually? Uh, so how are the demo how is the Democratic Party or the Republicans? How do they see the business? Uh, are their views different? Um, it's USA is it's about free economy, you know. Yes. Will that change from January 2021? It will. It depends on how the Biden administration. It depends on two things: on how the Biden administration is staffed, and it also depends on. This is very important. If Congress remains in the majority of uh, Republicans or if it becomes the majority of uh, Democrats. And let's go through uh, both of those points very quickly. Uh, the Biden administration, the, the Democratic administration basically has a choice in President Biden, President elect Biden has a choice. He can staff his administration, that is his cabinet members, his ministers in European parlance, and the agency heads, his ambassadors, his foreign service people, leadership. He can uh, staff those with pragmatists, what we might call moderates, and I, I don't approve of the use of labels, but I think we have a sense of uh, what that means. And that was a tactic that was taken by the Clinton administration in the 1990s, and to a certain extent in the second administration from uh, Obama, to a certain extent. If Biden does that, then uh, there, the difference between his administration for business and for the economic environment will not be that much different than a Republican administration will be. However, the Democratic Party, since there's only two parties in the US, there's a wide variety, a wide spectrum of political positions and tendencies among the individual parties. There are There is a strong contingent of the Democratic Party who are very strongly, let's call it socio, social democratic, and we would be familiar from that from European countries. Some of them are similar to Green Party members of uh, European governments, and some of them would some of them even call themselves socialists. So we're getting sort of further away from a free market uh, tendency with these politicians. If the Biden administration staffs itself with Democratic Party members on that end of the spectrum, then we will be getting uh, further away uh, from that. And the uh, other important thing to keep in mind is is how effective uh, can the Biden administration, the executive branch, be in governing, in new regulation, in establishing policy? That depends very much on who is in the majority in Congress. And we, we just had on the slide, the House of Representatives has a slight Democratic majority. They actually lost some of their majority compared to 2016. And with the Senate, we do not know because there are two outstanding senatorial positions 
that are still open. Right now, there's 50 Republican senators and there are 48 Democratic senators. And the two Senate positions from one state, the state of Georgia, are still open. And that will not be decided until a runoff, a second round election, which will take place on January 5th. So obviously, if the Republicans win at least one of those seats, they will maintain their majority and they will be much more effective in contesting or restricting or working against counterbalancing the work of the executive branch. So those two things are really uh, critical to for the business community and the economic environment. And until those two factors are clear and established, uh, we don't know for sure how much different it will be from the present administration or from a typical Republican administration. Uh, still, we got a couple of questions, and uh, the first one is, uh, are Trump's accusation of fraud in voting process legit or more media exposure? Uh, there have been, in all of the states, numerous examples of errors, especially in the processing and the counting of these mailed-in absentee ballots. However, those are small numbers. There have been mistakes in counting both auto, uh, with automated process and manual, but those are very small numbers. So that will not affect the results of the presidential election. For House of Representative uh, offices, such as my district, the 17th district in Pennsylvania, that is still open. It is not known yet officially who has won yet. So it can affect it at a smaller level, but not at this level. Nobody and Republican authorities have reviewed this. Democratic authorities have reviewed this. There is no evidence that there was any systematic or widespread fraud or deceit. Uh, I think we can safely assume that there wasn't that. So these claims that there was are not true or not founded. I need to read um, another observation and also question. Uh, thank you for a very interesting conversation and all your views. Uh, you must have been following the situation in Slovenia regarding the election in the US and you know all the tweets yes. of our prime minister. We, we yes. talk a lot about that. Yes. So uh, do you think that our prime minister's tweets will affect the relations between Slovenia and the United States? I don't think so, because uh, for one thing, uh, when the gov when the new administration starts, they're going to have a totally new foreign policy team. There's going to be a different um, secretary of state. Many ambassadors will be changed and replaced. So he'll be coming in with a fresh team that would be uh, Biden will tend to uh, to go with more, let's call them internationalists. That's always a tendency of the of the party, so of the Democratic Party. So they're going to have more outreach, I think, to foreign governments, even ones that were associated with the Trump administration, somewhat, uh, somewhat more. And uh, I think another thing that's uh, going to take place is is that. Uh, Biden and his administration, just from their own experience, Biden was a senator from Delaware for over 40 years and he was the vice president of the United States. They have a lot of experience in dealing with foreign governments and with foreign heads of state. I don't think that anybody is uh, going to hold a grudge against the Slovenian prime minister and the Slovenian government and say they're supporting Trump. Now, let me just add one thing, and we've talked about this already. In my opinion, it was counterproductive for the Slovenian prime minister to tweet or in any other way express that he believed that he uh, thought that Trump had won the election and that he congratulated him simply because it's counterproductive. It doesn't do any good. And he was taking a position before he really had a basis to take the position. And that just doesn't make any sense. It's not logical, it's counterproductive. We can't make decisions like that in business because we would lose market share, we would lose profits. Uh, so a business 
person, an entrepreneur, would not have done that, I don't think. OK, so okay. we are safe, you are saying. And I hope nobody from the prime minister's office or cabinet is listening to our coffee to connect. No, I'm kidding, Steve. <laughs> I hope um, they are. And that's just to me an observation, because let me add this. I obviously observe the uh, media in Germany, not just in the United States. When those tweets came out from the Slovenian prime minister, a lot of the German media was already starting to put Slovenia in a group of other countries in Central Europe, without mentioning any names, who are strongly associated with being against NATO, with being for Trump, and that is putting Slovenia in a false light. That's really putting false information out about Slovenia, and that is counterproductive. That's not good for the image of Slovenia. But I hope that, that uh, Slovenia and the United States will stay uh, connected in business and through culture, sports and everything uh, also in the future. So that 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 is what I'm hoping to. And you too, probably, Steve. Uh, I am. And all I can say is in practice, you and I are working with a lot of Slovenian companies who already are operating in the United States through e-commerce and they want to increase their operations, expand their operations, intensify them. And other new companies that are startups, the first day they start business, they're already thinking about doing business in the United States. And how do I know they're asking me about it? So yeah. I don't, I think business is going to prosper and expand regardless of it being a Republican administration in the executive branch or Democratic. And I believe American history has shown that. that that's good to hear. And uh, when a company is thinking of doing business in the United States or establishing an office or, or uh, a production unit, uh, an important issues are visas. So um, yes. Can we expect with the new administration more loose rules to obtain USA visa? What do you think? Yes, I would expect from the Biden or from a Democratic administration that there is not going to be anti-immigration rhetoric like there very often was under Trump. I don't expect that there is going to be arbitrary restrictions against it that were just declared from the executive branch from the president and pushed downwards however uh let's one thing that we can't forget is even though and this i always said this during the clinton and during the obama administration even if the foreign governments and foreign countries think well it's much easier to deal with Biden then with Trump, it's much easier, it was much easier to deal with Obama rather than George W. Bush. We can't forget all of them are the U.S. president, so they are going to follow policies that they believe are in the interest of the United States, even though nobody's going to say America first and make America great again. They're not going to say things like that. However, if the unemployment rates in the United States stays higher even after we have a recovery or we have vaccinations or whatever improvements we have on the COVID front, immigration will stay, at least in practice, in approval stricter because all politicians at all levels are under pressure to show they're trying to do something for employment. And the same thing is with trade policies. Biden is not going to come out and say, I'm going to impose tariffs and other restrictions on importing into the US. However, as we know, those tariffs are in a big book of 6,000 pages. His administration, the Biden administration, will change those and maybe not even say anything about it. So. We have to be careful about that. One thing to uh, notice before uh, as the last thing about immigration, this is something that was a little bit different in this election than some of the other ones in the past. The big tech companies and the social media companies, and as we know, there's lots of billionaire owners behind them. They supported with their contributions, with their words, of course, but we, you have to look at where did they spend their money? Where did they contribute? much, much, much more for the Democrats at all levels than for the Republicans. 
And those big tech and social media companies are big proponents of immigration because they like to bring in sometimes less expensive uh, experts from foreign countries. They will be pushing the Biden administration to be pragmatic slash a little bit more liberal on uh, immigration, even if the unemployment numbers are not as good as we would like them to be. Yeah, and you partially answered the question that was posed by Olga. He, uh, she asked, will USA now distance from Make America Great Again slogan and will return to negotiations with EU about trade agreements, especially some of our companies also from the field of steel or something like that were, yes. were much concerned in, in the past? Yes. Um, I believe that uh, President Biden, his administration, will continue the tradition of democratic uh, uh, administrations, which started at least with President Wilson over 100 years ago of internationalism and international engagement. At least they'll be speaking that way. So they're going to engage much more. It's going to be different in that respect than the Trump administration. Number one, the Biden administration will push towards rejoining the Paris Agreement on, in, on the environment. That's very, very clear. Uh, many of the states could already, in many regions of the United States, could already fulfill all of the standards but they're doing that by themselves without direction from the federal government under the Trump administration. And the Biden administration will support that. The Biden administration will also uh, come out and say they're in favor of NATO and they probably will be more supportive of uh, NATO than uh, President Trump was. And they will be much more engaged in multilateral uh, trade agreements. That does not mean that they're going to be more favorable to the EU or to other foreign uh, countries. Let's not forget Biden is going to be the president of the United States and he has to represent the interests of the United States and he has to continue sort of this tradition of, so to speak, being tough on trade, being tough against China, being tough against the EU, but I do, I believe there will not be this strident rhetoric of only American interests, make America great again. They will be much more diplomatic about it in what they say, but what they do may be just as tough as a Republican administration. So you don't think there, there will be any major changes in doing business for an international company from a company from Europe? with this new administration because the whole world was following this election like yes. like everything will change 100 percent after the mm -hmm. January. right nothing changes 100 percent uh or close to that because of all of the levels of government that we reviewed uh, at the beginning of our uh of our broadcast here uh what uh, will change of course is the style of the administration, but let's keep in mind uh, there will be a couple things that the Biden administration will likely do, changes that will likely be brought in that are very typical for uh, democratic uh, administrations. One of them, we talked about the environmental policies. The There will be more environmental regulation from the federal government on down above and beyond what the states are doing, so we have to be prepared uh, for that. For COVID, it's very possible that the Biden administration will try to regulate more things from the state level and try to convince the states to follow these. So there may be a bit more uniformity than there once was. And two other important things that are very important for business. One of them is uh, tax policy. Democratic administration tends to favor trying to collect more taxes. So there was a great or a large tax reform during the Trump administration, which lowered tax rates for corporations and lowered tax rates for individual people. Biden has already pro uh, proclaimed plans that would increase the tax rate somewhat, not to the level that they were before under the Obama administration, but in given cases, that will be an important factor. And one thing, this is very important that doesn't come out in the news, uh, he intends to change the favorable uh, tax treatment for capital gains. 
the, one of the greatest strengths of the United States for good or bad is this large and innovative private financial market. And a lot of that, much of its success is based on the fact that if you make a successful investment and you monetize it, you sell it, your the tax rate that you're paying is only between 15 and 20 percent. Biden's administration wants to make get rid of those rates and make them the same rates as for all of your other income, which in some cases will double that. It is not necessarily a good idea to work against one of the country's greatest uh, strengths. One last thing, the Biden administration will make a very strong push for universal health care. As we see in the news, there's a lot of misinformation about that. Healthcare in the United States is not 100%. There's a lot of inefficiencies about it. Probably about 10% of the population has no health insurance or is underinsured. And healthcare is done by the states. So in some states, you have better healthcare, better infrastructure, some states, other Democratic administrations, including the Biden administration, want to expand it for there to be federal universal health care, health insurance. We already have that in the United States for people over 65 and other people who are a large level below the poverty line, which is called Medicaid, Medicare. What they will try to do is roll that out theoretically almost to the entire uh, population. And that, of course, will be an additional uh, burden on employers mm -hmm. that they have to pay more into such systems possibly and they have a lot more regulation and administration administration to worry about in the united states traditionally the employer pays for the health care of the employees and then the employer has the right to figure out which which plan how much is covered in the plan then that's not typically the way it's done in european countries so what will happen if the democratic administration has success in implementing more universal health care then the federal government will say hey employers these are now the rules that you have to follow and much more than you necessarily had before and by the way you're still paying for all of it so that will be a additional challenge and burden for employers that we will have to keep in mind and for a small company those are very very significant mm -hmm. uh, costs i know the health care is the first uh, negotiation issue when you are uh, looking for a new job uh, Yes. We will take uh, the last question from the audience. So Ushka is asking um, what big tech company can expect from the next administration? Also in relations doing business with IT firm from Slovenia and EU market, considering data policy stands and regulations itself. So 5G, China, yes. privacy yes. shield probably. Yes, right. Uh, I would expect, for instance, all American administrations will be doing 5G and they will be trying to exclude uh, many foreign companies, but they will exclude uh, Chinese companies. I think that will be a continuation of that policy. For data protection or privacy issues, the Biden administration would probably be more open in negotiating perhaps a multilateral agreement or a bilateral agreement with the EU so that the US regulations are somewhat uh, closer. Right now, each company pretty much has to make sure that in their own contracts with their own customers, data protection is covered so that the EU regulations are abided for and the relevant ones in the US. And that will not, probably not be any easier. We already talked about immigration. Uh, immigration for big tech companies will probably be somewhat uh, a little bit easier, at least in practice. They may not actually proclaim that. And then the issue about um, regulation of the internet and regulation of telecommunications. Um, that is something that has become an issue much more lately, especially because the Trump administration perceived that all the social media and big tech companies were working against him, whether that was true or not. The Biden administration will take some of the tension away from that and probably will try to keep that issue off of uh, the table. So uh, I think the environment for big tech companies could potentially be more favorable for those reasons 
uh, in the future administration than they were under the past administration. Uh huh. And the last question, uh, we have another additional two minutes. Will okay. uh, Igor is asking, will Biden administration follow similar directions as did the Obama administration? Uh, to, uh, I believe there will be many similarities with the Biden administration and the Obama administration for many reasons. One of them are ideological reasons. They worked together for eight years, so they have a lot of similar opinions and views on things. He will certainly bring in experienced people from the uh, Obama administration. But what we don't know is, is that very first thing, one of the first things we talked about, will he staff his administration with more moderate pragmatists or will uh, he go more towards the uh, social democratic slash socialist part? And that was always a conflict in the Obama administration. And that is something that we can't answer yet. Yeah. Steve, uh, an easy question for the uh, uh, final. Um, what will President Trump do after that, after the presidency? Will he remain a part of political life? What do you I think? believe he will. He will continue to be a public figure because he has been a public figure his entire life and he will continue to do that. Um, I believe that the Republican Party would like to disassociate itself uh, from former President Trump, and we don't know yet to what extent they can. They cannot do it before January 5th, of course, because they do not want any distractions from Republican voters going out in the state of Georgia to vote for the Republican candidates for the two Senate position. I believe he will go out and he will claim for the rest of his life that he won, he was the victor, and he was cheated from his victory. If you read parts of Trump's unfortunate biography, The Art of the Deal, which was written in the early 1980s, one of Trump's principles in doing business is present everything as a victory. If it was a defeat, presented as a victory, and it will go down in history as a victory. He's definitely following his own advice, his own principles, and I see no way that he's going to deviate or change his view or change his behavior from that lifelong principle that he basically told us about almost 40 years ago. Uh, thank you, Steve. I will conclude this coffee with a. Uh, um similar like the President Trump. This was a victorial coffee. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you for all your answers. And I guess we will meet again with you at our coffee to connect in a year or two to see what is going on in uh, between business relations, uh, Slovenia and the United States. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, and enjoy the weekend. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you to the audience and thank you KPMG for being our November partner of Amchen Coffee to Connect. Enjoy the weekend. Bye bye.